Good afternoon, I'm Andrew Young and I'm the Chair of the ASPG Victorian Chapter and on behalf of Carolyn McBean, our uh, Deputy Chair and the rest of the Executive, welcome to our second seminar for the year. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land on which this Parliament House sits and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. In about five minutes I'm going to hand over to Vaughan Coops and our panel. But um, by way of introduction, we thought it would be useful to just talk about parliamentary committees um, in, a, in an overview sense in case some people aren't that aware of them. And before I do that, in case I forget at the end, I just want to thank Luke, Lucy and Julian from our AV Tech Unit for setting up all our tech side of things. And this is being recorded. So if you know people who couldn't make it today and are interested, this is being recorded. It will be available for them to see down the track. Okay, so committees. Um, we started off with old and new. The reason for saying that is because we tend to think of committees as being a far more contemporary aspect of parliament. We think of the chambers as being something that have been around for centuries and the committees have, haven't been around for very long, but in actual fact, committees have been around for centuries. Uh, what's different is the prevalence of committee work these days. So if you look at some historical texts uh, in terms of the UK Parliament, you'll find references to committees going way back centuries ago which looked at legislation. In a very small number of instances, they looked at other issues, but generally they were looking at legislation. Then you get to the 1800s and there's a change in the UK Parliament and they do start to establish, um, if you like, more of what we would think of as standing committees. In the 1860s, they uh, create a public accounts committee because the parliament has figured out that it's one thing to pass a bill giving government money, but they want to find out if it was actually spent for the reasons it was actually given to the government in the first place, so they set up a public accounts committee. So even things like that, we go back well over a century ago. What's new, of course, is committees that are for some members, and Roman and Ed might reflect on this, represent perhaps close to 50% of their working time as parliamentarians uh, at different parts of their parliamentary life because um, of the prevalence of committees and what they do. So committees are delegates of the houses. Uh, they, in effect, are subordinate to the house and that's regardless of whether they're established by an act or by standing orders or by a simple resolution of the house. Committee members are appointed by the houses. Historical texts refer to members undertaking their duties in a very impartial way in committees. But they were committees going back some way that almost always met in private and the texts will talk about the fact that meeting in private perhaps lent itself to them acting in a very impartial manner. Committees these days, particularly when it comes to their formal evidence gathering and hearings, etc meet in public most of the time, which I think is still a good thing. Um, one of the benefits of that, of course, is that um, it's a direct form of public engagement. It's the most direct form of public engagement that Parliament has, I think. It's with its committees. Whether that's related to developing policy, uh, legislative ideas, um, in that case, committees, of course, have a great benefit in comparison to the, the policy units in government departments because committees can go out, meet experts, call witnesses, have the general public interact with them in a way that public servants can't do if they're sitting in a policy unit in a government department. Then when it comes to the other type of inquiries committees do, which of course are those more inquisitorial inquiries because they're looking at an alleged failure of government administration, they may do that in a far more uh, cost-efficient way than a Royal Commission or a Board of Inquiry. So you can see the benefits of committees in different, in, in different contexts. Um, so just from a practical point of view, what, what do committees do? Well firstly, committees are obliged to conduct inquiries in most cases because the House passes a motion giving them a terms of reference. For some committees like the Scrutiny of Action Regulations, Public Accounts and the Integrity Oversight Committee, they may have some other standing obligations that um, are in a statute which require them to do inquiries regardless of what a House might give them. But for most committees, they're getting their terms of reference from the House itself. 
It's then up to the committee members to comply with the terms of reference. The terms of reference are the parameters for what the House wants the committee to look at. And it might particularly be the case that it's up to chairs to also try and ensure that the committee complies with those parameters, which is probably a challenge that Ed and Bronwyn might talk about. There's, um, now I think we've got, uh, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've printed out some copies of terms of reference. Yeah, so there are some term, hard copies of terms of reference floating around for people who perhaps haven't seen them much before, um, which will give you some context for what we're talking about. So they get their terms of reference. Committees then tend to meet in private with the Secretariat, the Secretariat of Parliamentary Officers who support the work of those committees. And they plan things like, will they take written submissions from the public? They almost always will. Will they undertake site visits? Will they have formal hearings? If they're going to have formal hearings, who are the witnesses? How do they decide who those witnesses will be? That's all done normally behind closed doors before the committee then launches the more public aspect of its inquiry. The committee also, as a collective, can determine whether hearings will be open or closed. Again, the overwhelming majority of them are open. That, that is, the public can uh, attend or watch online. Uh, but there occasionally will be reasons why they might decide to do something in camera. So how can committees do all this? Why can they do it? Well, one of the reasons they can do it is because, of course, um, the uh, thing that underpins parliamentary committees' powers is parliamentary privilege, both powers and immunities. The same as the House. Those powers and immunities can't exceed what the House has. But, of course, it does mean that a committee, for instance, by way of a power, could exercise the power to summons a witness who might be reluctant to attend or summons documents from the government, something like that. It doesn't happen very often. The other important aspect of it is immunities. So that is what members and witnesses say at a committee is protected from the general law. Uh, they cannot be prosecuted or, if you like, um, be subject to def defamation. That's a really important immunity that committees enjoy in order to gather that evidence. They ultimately, to complete the loop, they then report findings and recommendations back to the House. They do this after sometimes very lengthy deliberations uh, in private. They don't have to all agree, and in fact, if, if uh, a minority of members disagree on a particular um, recommendation or finding, they might attach what's called a dissenting or minority report at the end of the report. But the, what is tabled in the first part is the majority report of the committee. And then, ultimately, depending on what type of committee it is and what perhaps the rule in the standing order or the act might say, quite often a government response will, um, is due. Um, six months, I think, is probably born, still the most um, typical time frame in, within which a government response is due. It doesn't mean the government has to agree with what the committee has said. It's simply requiring the government to respond and say, yes, we agree with that, or no, we don't agree with that, and this is what we're going to do. So look, that's a very brief overview of committees, um, probably a very unsatisfactory introduction for, for all the things we could say about committees, but hopefully that just gives a bit of a backdrop to what um, uh, our two com committee members and uh, witness um, uh, will then talk about with Vaughan. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Vaughan Coops, Deputy Clerk of the Legislative Assembly and also uh, a member of our ASPG executive um, who will run the panel session. Over to you, Vaughan. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so look, first I'll take great pleasure in uh, introducing our panel. So. Uh, here on, well, on your right, we've got Ed O'Donoghue, um, who's, uh, well, I'll let you know a little bit about him. So, um, Ed was a member of the Legislative Council representing Eastern Victoria from 2006 to 2021. He uh, held a number of um, positions as Minister for Corrections, Crime Prevention and Liquor and Gaming Regulation in the Napthine Government, and was um, uh, Shadow Minister in a number, number of positions over that time as well. Um, including as Shadow Attorney General. Um, Ed was the chair of the Legal uh, Legislative Council Legal and Social Issues Committee when it conducted its inquiry into life choices, which is one of the inquiries we're going to 
focus on today, um, but he's served on a whole bunch of committees while he's been um, with the Legislative Council, um, the Scrutiny of Action Regulations Committee, where he's chair, Law Reform Committee, Accountability and Oversight Committee as chair, Privileges Committee, and others as well. So, um, clearly, a lot of experience in the committee's world um, um, with Ed here. Uh, next to Ed, we've got Ian uh, Smith. Um, Ian's working on a PhD at um, the law school at La Trobe University. His research is focusing on the politics of law reform uh, with a particular reference to the 2014 to 2016 law reforms in Victoria um, that retrospectively removed anonymity from sperm and egg donors um, in regard of um, donor conceived children. Um, Ian is himself a sperm donor um, from the 1980s and he made a submission um, broadly in favour of removing donor anonymity and was witnessed during the 2011 to 2012 Law Reform Committee uh, in the Victorian Parliament um, when it conducted an inquiry into whether um, information about donors should be disclosed to donors conceived children. Uh, and next to Ian we have Bronwyn Halfpenny who's the member for Thomastown uh, currently uh, and um, has been representing that electorate since 2010. Uh, prior to that, she was with the industrial office at the um, Victorian Trades Hall Council. Um, Bromans served on a number of committees and a number of significant inquiries as well, including the Family and Community Development Committee uh, during its inquiries into senior Victorian participation, participation and employment of those with mental Ill health, and abuse of children in non-government organisations, um, the betrayal of trust inquiry, which is a significant one that led to a lot of reform as well. Um, Roman was also chair of the Environment, Natural Resources and Regional Development Committee when it conducted its inquiry into the CFA Training College at Fiskville, which is, again, one of the main, one of the um, inquiries that we're gonna focus on when we talk about things today. So, um, Andrew's given us an overview of how committees work very generally, like um, and the public and things that most people know about committees. Um, so I'll just ask a few questions from the panel, and we we'll just go through and just um, explore some of the things that happen in committees generally. So we know about terms of reference, submissions, public hearings, and and the public processes that happen with committees, and then you table a report in the houses, which is public, and then uh, eventually you get a government response to that. Um, but a lot of what committees do happens away from the public gaze. So the question I'd like to ask the panel, maybe Ed, you can lead off with this one. Um, what needs to happen behind the scenes to make committees effective? One of the great challenges, I think, for committees is resourcing. Um, Andrew mentioned in his introduction that uh, parliamentary committees can often achieve outcomes or recommendations in a far more timely and cost-effective way than perhaps a, you know, a part of the public service, and I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, a constant challenge, I think, is for the um, the parliament and 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 government funding the parliament to recognise the the role the committees play. And there's obviously a tension there that the more funding government provides to to committees, the more they can look into things and uh, you know get get into issues that perhaps the government finds uh, less comfortable or doesn't want explored. So I, I think funding is uh, an issue. Um, as a committee itself, I think it's always important to have good relationships across a committee, regardless of political affiliation, and to sort of build uh, a degree of trust with those you're working with, particularly when they're, the terms of reference or the issues are not uh, particularly political or adversarial. Obviously, some select committees can be very adversarial, and having that relationship of trust can be, you know, difficult. But generally, particularly early in a parliament's term, um, if you can build trust uh, with the deputy chair and the chair and the committee members, it, it makes a seem, you can have seamless uh, sort of working together and achieve much better outcomes. Oh, okay. Um, I think I agree with um, a lot of what Ed was saying, um, but that I think that um, in order for a committee to work well, you really have to be able to build up that trust between, because you've got you know, different people from different political parties, so they have to, one, um, know it's confidential so that nothing's sort of going to be said um, if you want to speak freely and put up your arguments and that sort of stuff. Um, that's really important, because in the end, 
a lot of the, I've found with committees um, when you're doing the deliberations, you really can negotiate. Like there's normally a fair bit of goodwill and um, there's not always that big a difference. Um, it depends, of course, if it's a more political um, committee uh, reference than, than say, a, a one that's more um, not as political. Um, so, for example, the CFA fiscal inquiry, that was highly political um, because that was an election commitment by Labor, um, whereas the child abuse inquiry was not political in the sense that, you know, we all, um, you know, so that was just such a, a um, thing that was sort of happening and really did need to be exposed. So, um, I think it depends on what the, what the reference is. Uh, in terms of the staff for committees, um, I've worked with some really good people and they're key as well because um, it's about resources but also their ability to sort of gain, c extract consensus because sometimes they act as a little bit of a, the referee amongst it all or try to put up some other ideas. Um, and of course they are there full time so they really are the ones that are doing all the research whereas as Member of Parliament you know, there's a whole lot of competing um, time constraints so we sort of really rely heavily and we, you know, we have to trust those um, people, the researchers and I think executive officer is, yeah. I've got two perspectives on that question. First of all, when I was a, a witness and made submissions to the, to the committee, and at that point, I didn't really know much about what was going on in the background. My understanding of what was going on in the background comes from my research more recently, where I've talked to a lot of the members of that, that law reform committee, as there was, and other members of parliament, and I've seen the degree to which, the, as, as both speakers have said, the, the cross-party collaboration that went on there and the, what I'd describe as the political schmoozing that went on out in the corridors out here and in the party rooms and so on, was so important in getting, getting agreement uh, at, at, at the end to that, on, you know, the, the, the committee that I'm looking at, quite a, quite a contentious question. I guess, um, so not it, so in particular, I guess, for Ed and, and Bronwyn, uh, who have been involved in quite a few inquiries and quite a few reports, not every report arrives with a splash and makes a big impression. Quite a few sort of go off into the table doc documents database and, and, you know, and you never really hear of them, of them again. What in your experience, what makes the difference between a report that, you know, that actually drives some change and, and leads to some outcomes and, and one that sort of disappears into the ether? Um, that sort of, because sometimes, even if it doesn't make a splash, things do still happen. Um, and But sadly, none of us really know, because once um, a committee report has been sort of made published, uh, then the government has, I think, six months to respond to that report, the recommendations, and then, um, you know, whatever time, you know, and that might be yes, no, in principle, a bit more detail. Uh, but then, of course, it's the, you know, machinery of government and legislative change, which could take sort of years to happen. So, and you don't necessarily get your feedback as time goes by. So sometimes I think we could say there isn't things happening when actually there is. Um, but I, I suppose, you know, media always allows for a higher profile um, report to be sort of more, people made more aware, so that's putting pressure um, to see uh, more from it. Uh, but also, I guess, I always try to follow up afterwards and just sort of, you know, chief nagger, you know, what's, where's it going, what's happening, um, and to try to get other members of the committees to do that as well. Um, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's not a systemic change, that's just um, to sort of get some information. But I, I think most of them generally do create some change of some sort uh, and findings are also very important because findings, you know, make, um, uh, talk about things such as in the CFA inquiry, you know, we made a finding that the CFA management did know that the um, training centre was contaminated and they did nothing about it. So. That was sort of something I guess you could sort of grab onto as a as a justice issue, um, even though it wasn't a recommendation. Putting on my researcher hat and, and looking at the politics of law reform, which is what I'm interested in, I'd agree with Bronwyn's point that even if the committee report and recommendations don't don't hit in a big way, I think there is impact. There's impact from just from people being heard in that, that committee process. So I think there is value. 
But to, to go to your question, Vaughan, the, the, the uh, committee report that I'm looking at that, that recommended removing anonymity from sperm and egg donors, I think the big thing there that really hit in that inquiry and led the committee to its conclusions were the stories that it heard from people. There were really intense human stories that, that grabbed people. And that, that committee, uh, Clement Brown, who was the chair of the committee in his forward to the report said, when we started, we were all of a view that, no, no, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't take away anonymity from people like me, who had been promised that 30 and 40 years ago. By the end of the committee, the entire the end of the process, the entire committee was of the view, yes, we do need to do this. They'd been persuaded by the people that they heard. Yeah. It's, uh, I'd like to echo uh, Bronwyn and Ian's points, because just, and, and Andrew actually mentioned this in his introduction, just the hearing of evidence from stakeholders and individuals who are personally affected by government policy or uh, intransience from, gov from government can be powerful in and of itself, regardless of what the recommendations of a subsequent report ultimately are. That was very much the case with the End of Life Choices Inquiry that Lillian was the executive officer for. Um, the, the stories we heard were compelling and powerful. But, but similarly, um, there are many inquiries that don't make a splash, but that I don't think is a bad thing. Uh, recommendations from inquiries can lead to reform within government. Um, departments can use it as a justification for a policy change that objectively is in the public interest. It's got cross-party support, therefore it's not political. Um, it can advance an issue. Um, Lily and I also want, did the machinery of government change, which could be hardly less exciting from a public perspective, <laughs> but I think made some good recommendations. Um, some of which have been picked up by, by government, which is fantastic. And uh, perhaps, Ian, your next research task could be to track recommendation implementation over time. Because I think if that task was done, the, the percentage of recommendations ultimately implemented, whether it takes a year, five or ten years, would be surprisingly high. So recommendations, again, Andrew and I had a conversation about this several years ago, recommendations can sit on a shelf and then get picked up by a new government, picked up by a new minister, picked up by a new de departmental secretary, and run with. So by making those recommendations, you actually never know when they will see the light of day or, and be implemented, but I, I think more are implemented than perhaps we all would appreciate. Um, and I know Bridget, Bridget Noonan's just walked in, who's the clerk of the assembly, who would be really, um, and, and one thing we often talk about is how, how, do, how do you measure outputs for committees? And, and if you can't, is there a meaningful way to actually look at what committees do and what they produce? Or is it just, or is it sometimes just so, um, you know, such a distance between the potential effect of a committee's recommendations and, and what actually happens? Is, is there any meaningful way to look at that? Or is, it, or is it, should we just leave them all alone and do their thing? <laughs> it's an out of the bag question, I'm sorry about that, yeah. Um. Um, the, yeah, I'm sort of, it's always good to have evidence and to collect data, I suppose. Um, I, I sort of, I, I, think, I, I think there is something like that does sort of happen somewhere, doesn't it? Um, but I don't think we ever, I don't know if it's made uh, public, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's always, it would always be good to track. Um, what recommendations are made, what the government's response is, and how those recommendations come to see the light of day. Because, um, of course, there's also the, the issue that there might be one recommendation, but it doesn't mean that that's interpreted the same um, by the committee um, as compared to what, how it's interpreted by um, you know, the public service or um, the government. It's a good question because I think the value proposition is easy to make. Um, the committee that Bronwyn was on, the Betrayal of Trust, I think had parliamentary resources plus $2 million top up from executive government. Um, if that was a Royal Commission, that would have been 50 to $100 million. Um, similarly, the end of life choices inquiry was done without any supplementation from government, just from the resourcing of, uh, of the parliament committee budget. And that's driven change that's now been adopted virtually across the country. So. I think the business case for the output of committees is is clear and, and easy to make, um, and I hope the uh, DTF officials 
watch this video in due course. <laughs> I, I think your research idea, Ed, is a good one of, from a public policy perspective, having a look at where, where do those recommendations and ideas from committees, where do they end up? And I think you're probably right, there's more of them actually filter through than one might immediately expect. Thank you. I'm going to change tack a little bit and something that's probably always, I've always been a bit curious about as someone who's worked closely with committees as a parliamentary officer, as a secretariat point of view. Um, Ed and Bronwyn, what does being on a committee mean to members generally and why do they do it? Is it um, regarded as a good thing, a rite of passage, a box to tick or a punishment? Uh, it, like, is it core business for members? I think so. Um, and I always enjoyed being on committees. I mean, you learn, uh, from a personal point of view, you learn so much about the subject and um, it, was re it was always interesting and you also felt it was a sort of tangible way to actually, you know, most people that come into politics, they sort of want to make change. And so um, committee work, you felt that you were actually, you know, in a concrete sort of way, maybe able to influence or, um, you know, have some sort of a say, I guess, in some sort of a way. Uh, and the, when um, Ian was talking about you know, people making submissions to public, like that, the lived experience and to have that contact with people that, um, have lot gone through or had the effect of really, as a, I guess, a, a, a politician to see what um, the effect of a, a law or a system has on everyday people during their life is really, um, really valuable thing because, I mean, we are all everyday people but we don't experience all the things, um, but to hear those sort of experiences from individuals is great. Um, I never saw it as a punishment, uh, but particularly when you're first inter elected to parliament, it was a great way to learn um, a lot of stuff. And, you know, just to sort of, so I think you really um, sort of matured a bit in terms of the way you sort of thought about things. Uh, and you also got a lot of support from the secretariat um, in sort of the processes and procedures. Uh, and I know other members of parliament have said to me um, that have come later that, you know, they really learn a lot from the experience. Um, and also um, felt that they were better able to represent people from hearing from them. And how did you, how did you feel about, oh, oh for, 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 hand it well, to you Well, okay, too, so I haven't been on a committee, obviously, but my observation, again, putting my researcher hat on, is it, it, from what I heard from the members of parliament who I've spoken to on those committees, it, yeah, they really see it as valuable. It's a way to make an, an impact. Clem Newton-Brown, who, who can't be here tonight, I've heard him say publicly a number of times, the work he did on that committee and what that committee achieved was one of his biggest achievements when he was in Parliament. So absolutely, I, my sense I get from, from the people I talk to um, in my research is yes, it's, it's really serious work. Um, it, it is taken seriously. Obviously marginal seat members often reluctant to uh, spend too much time on parliamentary committees to take them outside their electorates. As a former upper house um, EMP, perhaps had could have more discretion as far as um, uh, time and choosing where to spend my time. But as Bronwyn said, often the issues you learn about in parliamentary committees help you represent your constituents. One of the first um, uh, inquiries I was on was organ donation in 2008, where Richard Willis was the executive officer and. Um, it was fascinating. I knew nothing about organ donation. I learned so much. And over the next, you know, 15 years or so that I was in, or 13, 14 years I was an MP, after that time, I had lots, several constituents come in uh, with associated issues regarding organ donation. Um, and I was actually able to help them in a way that I just would not have been able to if I hadn't sat on that inquiry. Um, and as someone who spent the majority of my parliamentary time in opposition, um, uh, committees are a great way to get access to senior decision makers. Using that organ donation inquiry example again, the CEOs of the major um, health services in Melbourne came and gave evidence um, and enabled you know, me as a committee member to talk to them uh, both through that formal process but then informally afterwards build relationships with those um, you know, senior people and then you know, deal with them subsequently on different issues. So it's a great way to build relationships, build network, build knowledge, um, which ultimately helps your constituents. And that's uh, uh, ultimately the, the purpose of, of, of uh, being an MP. Um, 
Good, the bells aren't going to ring. It sounds like they're just adjourning, they're getting ready for the adjournment in, this, in council, so that's great. Um, Ian, well, I guess on that too, um, the three inquiries that we're sort of focusing on today um, all involved witnesses or people sharing highly personal stories um, uh, that Bronwyn sort of referred to that you know, can, really can have an effect on members and, and influence their decision making. Uh, how did it, um, I, what did it mean to you as a person sharing a highly personal story? And, and I know that you've spoken to other, you know, other people who made submissions to the inquiry or you know, appeared before it. Um, what were some of the challenges that you and others sort of feel bringing those stories to a, to a, to a forum like a committee? Mm. Yeah, so they were, it was very personal stuff that we were talking about. I was a sperm donor. I, uh, walked, it was in this room that the committee met. And I walked in, OK, I'm a sperm donor. I'm here to give you that perspective. That's not something you sort of talk about day to day. So, so exposing oneself in that very personal fashion was important. And I, I can recall well the sense that we were really, I was really listened to, the other people who were there on the day were really listened to very respectfully. You could see, you could see that in, in the committee. And you're right, I've talked to a number of people um, since then. I've spoken, for example, to, there's one sperm donor in particular who, who was trenchantly opposed and still is to the changes that happened, the removal of anonymity. He spoke to the committee, he made an anonymous submission even though he was really unhappy with the outcome, he felt he had been heard. He, he was really, and is still really unhappy with the outcome, but you know, the important thing was he heard, and those voices were, were heard. Um, similarly, the, the, in, in my view, one of the pivotal stories that swung that particular inquiry was from a young woman who had uh, stage four cancer, uh, and she told her very personal story to the committee and it had a, had a huge impact and I, I know that it, it, that story made its way all the way up to then Premier Bayview and, and, and it impacted there. So yeah, the, the, those stories are really, in my observation, heard very respectfully in, in that committee at least. I guess um, Ed and Bronwyn, as, as members of the committee's hearing those stories, were there any challenges for you there as well? I mean, I guess nowadays in committees we're sort of talking more about, you know, um, the effects on people of hearing these kind of stories and, and you get subjected to some fairly, um, you know, some fairly robust situations in those committee hearings. Any particular observations or was it all popular? It, 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 it can, um, can be challenging and, and um, again the parliament through the secretariat for the end of life choices inquiry organised assistance for those people giving evidence uh, uh, and also for, for members was made available as well which was a great initiative I think of, of the parliament and the, the committee system for the parliament. Um, often the most complex difficult issues that can't be resolved through the normal channels are the ones that are given to parliamentary committees to figure out and sort out and so often by their very nature the references are challenging in a policy sense but also in a human sense. And um, one of the great things I think about the committee process is that at a time of great cynicism about politics, about um, many of our institutions, when people actually inter interact with a parliamentary committee, they invariably, as Ian, Ian articulated, whether they agree with the outcome or not, feel like they've had a decent hearing and they've been part of a, a bigger process that is um, valid and justified and has heard them. And that in and of itself is a fantastic outcome, a fantastic good, as I say, particularly at a time when there's such cynicism about politics, the motivation of politicians, and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, well, the two inquiries, the CFA inquiry and the child abuse inquiry, um, yeah, they were both really awfully sad and... Um, you know, some people had never disclosed um, things before until the committee, which was both in camera in some cases and public, um, and and they weren't believed in a lot of cases. You know, we had people talking how they'd written to all sorts of people with their story and just never heard back. No one ever believed them. No one. Or they were met with sort of hostility. So um, coming to speak to the committee. I think they sort of felt a bit like empowered by it as well. So validated because um, they were believed, but also empowered because they could 
sort of rise above that past and uh, contribute to sort of a, a better future for other people with um, better protections. Um, and that was both at the CFA and with the Child Abuse Inquiry, because I know, for example, the, the, the family of farmers in Balan, where their um, land was completely contaminated uh, and they were basically ostracised by um, some, uh, but as part of the inquiry and the findings, um, it was really sort of without doubt that this had happened and that they, um, what they were concerned about was real. So, yeah, and that has an effect on you as a committee member as well, both hearing the, the stories as well as um, being able to help in terms of, you know, well, really, it was the, the witnesses that really made um, the change happen. So they really were sort of a bit of a vehicle to help them do it. Even though, um, so there's positives in the committees getting to hear from a range of people and things, but at the end of the day, committees are comprised of usually, you know, seven or eight members. Um, they're given information by a small secretariat of maybe two or three staff, um, if that even sometimes, and, and it, they have limited time resources. They can only see so many people. They can only receive so many, or have time to consider so many submissions. Um, to what extent do you, can committees feel confident that they've actually, that they're forming a representative view or, or, or adequately informed view, or are they just an echo chamber for the people who are lucky enough to get in the door? That's a really good question, because you, I think all <laughs> committees have to be, the committee chair and the secretariat, when they're thinking about uh, where to go and who to hear from, have to make sure that balance is right in hearing from peak bodies, hearing from government, as well as hearing from individuals. So, you know, when the Legal and Social Issues Committee was dealing with a reference that it had impacts on the justice system, it was always critical to hear from, from government, a submission from government, the, the peak bodies like the Law Institute and the Bar Council, um, and then to also hear from individuals so that you do get a, a balanced perspective um, that, that not only hears from individuals who've been perhaps aggrieved and want um, change the system, but also from peak bodies or the department or the government about why the status quo is in place and why they believe it should stay the same or, or change. And getting that balance right, getting that right representation of e evidence is critical to laying the foundation of a good committee report with solid, supportable recommendations. Um, e evidence from I individuals is obviously critical and their experiences that evidence from a, a peak body, um, which draws upon perhaps hundreds of members, um, is also critical for a, a, broader, a broader context. So that's a, a really important part of the, the committee's work. As you say, time is scarce, resources are scarce. Um, where that, that time and en energy and resources are spent um, will determine the quality and veracity of any recommendations and findings that are made. Um, maybe just a quick add to that. Um, I think sometimes they are um, in, in the sense that um, we don't, if we're talking about individual submissions or people coming, you know, who have been affected by something, the lived experience, um, because, you know, and I think it's with everything, how do those people find out about an inquiry to actually come? So I, I look at some of the ones that I was involved in and you know, ones around mental ill health. So this was years and years ago, so not so much now. We didn't really get many individuals um, that suffered from mental ill health. Um, or uh, there's, you know, particular communities within Victoria that probably um, aren't likely to come forward and talk about things. So I think um, this is going to always be a challenge. I'm, I'm not saying that that's... Um, something that means that we don't get to hear the real story or we find out, but I think sometimes uh, we just have to think about, yeah, how do we get really down in there and, and find those people? I think it is a risk that the committees are just hearing the very loud voices. I, I mentioned a moment ago that, that uh, in my view, one of the, there was a very compelling, one particular very compelling story that, that I think was pivotal in the case of the Data Conception Inquiry in, in law, there's a, there's a truism that says hard cases make bad law. And so if you applied that to that instance I'm just talking about, that really compelling personal case, did the whole decision tip around that? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. 
That said, with the donor conception, the, the Law Reform Committee inquiry came down with its report and said, yes, we think you should remove anonymity from sperm donors. The government in its response said, okay, we're hearing that, but we want to hear more on this topic. So what happened was there was a further inquiry that went out and, and found more sperm and egg donors and talked to them. And that, I think, provided a sort of safety valve of checking, right? Let's check what the committee said, see if there is a broader view in, in favour of that. But ultimately, committees like this have got to listen to the voices that they hear. They can't interview the entire population. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've got to listen to what they hear and then make a judgment. And that, that's what they do. That's what they should do. <laughs> it's their job. Great. Um, Bronwyn, I don't want to keep you. I know you've got something else to go to. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I'll track you down later and, and give you the proper thanks. Um, yeah, but appreciate your time. Thank you. I really apologise. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, I might just stay with you, Ian, um, on that. Then um, it's, it's more of a question also about your experience through committees. What, what did you not understand about committees and how they work um, before you're a witness or, a, or a, you know, provide a submission to an inquiry? I, I'm not even sure that I knew that parliamentary committees existed before I became a witness. Um, I was, I, I'd become in, involved with the group of donor conceived people who were lobbying for those changes, and they told me there's an inquiry on at the moment, would you be prepared to make a submission? So I did and appeared as a witness. So I don't think I really knew that that process was there, and, and that's an interesting observation. I wonder how many of the general population would know that within the parliament there is that committee system and the work that it, that it, that it does. Putting my researcher hat on, I now have a much better understanding of, of the work the committees do and, and how important and valuable that is. But yeah, and when I first came in, very limited understanding of the process. How about you, Ed? Did you, well, I mean, it's, you've, you've had a lot of experience now, so it might feel like it's too much of a distant question, but I, I guess it's maybe either, what did you not know about committees before you became a member, or maybe what do you think people don't know about committees generally having been a member for quite a long time. I, I knew a little bit about parliamentary committees, but not a lot um, mm. before becoming a member. I, I think the general community has very little understanding a, at all. Um, one of the things that used to really get me down over time being an MP was people, you know, a significant proportion of the community's general just lack of interest in, uh, in government and democracy and the parliament, how it operates. And if you think, think of the hierarchy of perhaps what people know, people watch, see question time interactions on, on the TV news, they might understand a bit about the upper and lower house. Um, I think parliamentary committees for most people is not really on their radar. Um, and I think that's a pity because if people understood more the work the committees do, they would appreciate the work of, of the parliament much more. Because as, as Bronwyn said and Ian said, uh, and from my experience, um, you know, you generally work very, collect very collaboratively across party lines for, um, to get good outcomes for public policy change. And um, that can you know, take a lot of parliamentarians' time and it's for a public good. And I think if people appreciate, understood that more, there'd be perhaps less cynicism in the community. Um, <clears throat> Another slight change in tack, but um, so working committee space can be quite complex and particularly where I, I guess where the government or the executive is also active in that space. Um, for example, during the life choices inquiry, um, the government launched its own consultation phase while the inquiry was still active um, for Fiskville and Bronwyn can't talk about it now because he's gone, but um, there was also a point at which um, during that inquiry the, the committee had to go to fairly extraordinary ends to try and get some documents, not necessarily from the executive, but from, from the CFA and had to table a report in Parliament to, to, sh to draw attention to the fact that they hadn't been able to get a, a hold of those documents. Um, how important is it for committees to maintain um, a, set, you know, a distinct identity from the executive when they're doing their inquiries? That's a really good question. I think it's, it's critical. and. Um uh, as Andrew said in his introduction, the committees are a, function, a, a, a part of the parliament. The part of parliament is independent of the executive. 
and the committees operate to terms of reference that they must respond to. Um, and they're set by uh, a motion of the House or by legislation. Um, and, and therefore, uh, whatever the executive does shouldn't really influence the work of the committee. Um, with the end of life choices inquiry, when the government announced its, its processes, the committee resolved um, both government and non-government members just to keep going as we were going, basically, and do our, do our thing, discharge our, our obligation to the House. And, and report back to the House, and that's that's what we did, and I think that's really the only thing a committee can or, or should do. From an outside perspective, I think it's really important that the committees are there and that they're separate from the the executive government from from the bureaucracy because they've got, they've, as I've seen from from the work I'm doing, they've got a particular role. They've got a, a particular set of clout that, that, that goes with what they do, that, and, and, and that's that's really important. Um, and, and yeah, they just they again my observation. I wouldn't have known it when I when I first appeared before a committee, but but now having looked at the work of them, yeah, they, they, that that work they do is important. And we should touch them before. Some of what comes out of those committees will pop up in odd places. It 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 won't always resolve in a big bang report, but it percolates out. Well, um, so I guess um, it's probably more a question for Ed as well. Sometimes I guess those executive actions have sort of affected the work of the committee and, and there's, I guess there's a lot of negotiation to occur there. How important is it for you to maintain a relationship, I guess, with the public service or with government while sort of managing those tensions with the committee and, and how do you manage that relationship as you go? That's a good question and, and Bronwyn referred earlier to the importance of the executive officers and the committee staff and they're often the, the conduit to accessing information, to um, uh, dealing with the department, um, you know, reminding departments of when their submission might be due or the documents that have been requested uh, have not been provided and are due. And so that's generally done at an arm's length uh, from the members, at least formally anyway. Um, government members on a committee obviously can, can speak to um, departmental officials far easier than opposition members can, so they might be able to uh, remind a an official that you know, a, report is, uh, a submission is due, information is due. But that is a relationship that needs to be maintained because often a, a government submission or, or documents that are held by, by government are critical to understanding an issue and can be central to you know future findings so um, that that can be very very important and that often gets back to the role of the uh, executive officers and the, and the work they do um, the role of the executive officers again Bronwyn touched on it earlier but it's it's absolutely critical and because uh, they oversee the research they do the research themselves they liaise with the witnesses they help uh, decide which witnesses are, would be the best value in a public hearing. They make recommendations about perhaps a closed hearing that may be requested, which committees can do also. And so their tasks and work uh, are limitless and the work they do really helps drive you know, the outcomes of those committees. So um, should we just leave it to the Secretariat? What do, what do members bring to the committees? <laughs> I should have got someone from <laughs> <laughs> got Lillian to come on. <laughs> yes, anyone, anyone in the uh, audience want to answer that question? <laughs> um, well, I think the thing members can bring is a perspective. Members of Parliament come from such a diverse range of backgrounds, and when you put three or four different political parties together in the same room in a group of seven people to come with, up with answers to a problem, um, you know, there's a filtering process, and, and then there's experiences and perspectives that are all drawn upon and when you can get consensus on recommendations from that that diverse background and those different perspectives and those different objectives i think the public can then know well this is and government can know this is a pretty solid foundation for reform um, so the executive officers obviously do a great job in providing the evidence helping elucidate the evidence through uh, witness submission collation and the like. Um, but then the, the MPs through public hearings and their own research and their own knowledge 
plus those filters they, they bring and those perspectives they bring, uh, when you have you know, Liberal, Labor, National, Green and whoever else agreeing on a particular outcome, um, I think the community can say, well, that's probably a supportable outcome with evidence that's got cross-party support um, and that is a solid foundation for, for reform. Yeah, I don't want to editorialise too much, but in my observation, it was really what members bought was a pragmatic sort of political prison to all the research and the other thing and the, and the evidence that witnesses bring. Um, we are coming near to the time, so I'd like to open up if anyone has any questions they might like to put to Ian and Ed. Hi, Tim. There is, good, good question Tim, um, and there is value. Um, a, a committee member can ask for a division in a, a on a recommendation or a finding and for that to be recorded. Uh, and so there are ways for MPs to record their opposition to a particular recommendation or a particular finding while still voting for a report. So that's a, an important process that allows uh, MPs to express their personal dissent or perhaps their, uh, their political parties taking a position on a specific issue that's picked up in a recommendation that they just can't support, but they support the overall recommendations of a report. Um, it gives them that, that outlet or that capacity to do that. As Andrew said too, the ability for members to lodge a minority report or dissenting report I think is really important. Um, and that uh, can also add to the public debate. Um, there's been you know, many examples where minority reports have been picked up in the public realm um, and highlighted by media and that sort of added to the debate about a particular set of recommendations. And indeed a government of the day in the future could perhaps pick up um, recommendations for minority report of members perhaps of that political party that at some future time find themselves in government. Um, so that's an you know, important part of the process as well. Um, outcomes are not always unanimous, they're not always um, that way, but that's, that's fine, that's, that's democracy, and members of a committee can express that either through calling for a division on a recommendation or through a, a minority report. In the case of the, the committee that I'm particularly interested in, in, in the final report, they made it very explicit that they had all, at the outset, been of a view to not support these law reforms, and then they'd shifted to the completely opposite position. So they were, they were making very clear the fact that they'd, they'd made that mind shift, and I think that was important for people reading that report, either people who liked the, their recommendations or not. They were saying quite explicitly, here, here was our thought process here, and, and here's where we started, and here's where we shifted to. It's different to your, your precise question about, about votes, but it, it goes in that direction, I think. Yes. It depends, it depends at what point. Um, if it's during adoption of the report, then it's recorded. If it's um, during deliberations that aren't part of the actual report adoption, then it's private to the committee. Yeah. So, uh, question up the back. That's a really good question and a difficult one to answer, particularly for inquiries that receive hundreds and hundreds of submissions um, and making the choice about which submitters to hear from can be a really difficult process and I suppose 
the question has to be what's the value add of the public appearance from what's been the written submission. Um, the, the truth is that MPs are time poor and often don't have the chance to read every single submission and uh, rely on the Secretariat to highlight perhaps the, the, key, the key issues, the key points of difference um, to determine which witnesses to hear from. Uh, I think the answer to your question is sometimes the more uh, human inquiries, the face-to-face the, uh, -face, um, submissions can be so powerful just because of the human dimension to them. Um, whereas perhaps in other more, uh, uh, in other, in other, other, other committee hearings, um, you know, the, the weight of the evidence from the, the submitters at an oral presentation really depends on the, the veracity of their evidence. The, the great thing about a, a um, public hearing is not only does the person submitting get to give their opinion and their perspective, committee members get to challenge it. So, you know, the, someone might give a very powerful presentation, but if there's key facts you can present that, um, you know, mitigate the, that, that presentation, then that can be really powerful too. So that sort of interplay can really uh, be very helpful in getting to the nub of issues. And often what you find, although the committee process is very formal, often you, have a, you can have an informal dialogue basically with a witness about, well, you said this, but what about that? And another witness last week said that, what do you say to this? And you know, if you, the chair is, um, is minded to, you can really let that conversation flow to get to the bottom of an issue or, or at least the bottom of a perspective that help, real, helps really inform um, and helps committee members understand perhaps the issues. Often witnesses, expert witnesses come uh, with a lifetime of understanding and research in a particular area in front of seven members of parliament who really are new to the issue. And so by having that dialogue and that interchange, you can really get the nub and that really, really helps a great deal. One of the things that I remember from the day that I appeared as a witness before that committee, I was with another sperm donor at that, at that time, and the committee chair said to us, this is the first time we have heard directly from you, sperm donors. They had heard people speaking on our behalf from the clinics, the clinicians, and, and it really struck me that this is the first time we've heard directly from you, and it's really important that we do. And I also recall from that, that day, that, that dialogue, conversation that Ed's just talking about. We, we, it wasn't just a matter of us, the, the two of us, just sort of parroting our, our submission. That was the starting point, but they asked us questions and they were, they were very engaged. So yeah, I think there is real value in getting those people there. You can quiz them, you can cross-examine them if you like. Well, that brings us to time, so I will stop it there. But thank you very much, uh, Ed and Ian, and Bronwyn, um, which was here. Really appreciate your participation today. I have some gifts from the Parliamentary Library, yes, which are fantastic. So I'd like to I'll hand these over to you. But please, um, um, applause for our panel. And perhaps if we could also, a round of applause for Vaughan, who um, put, put that together.